kept hurting worse and worse with every surgery. I told him, I said, I need you guys just cut it off. So you're like the, you're like the internet Batman. You got the voice, you got the skills, yeah, you're putting yo, guys in facts, jail. Facts. Can you say vengeance for me one time? <laughs> vengeance. Oh, no, that was <laughs> sex. <laughs> Oh, you fucking know your pants. Guys are looking sharp. Zach Dingy. Tony Cavallari. Two Hoops, Three Legs Podcast, where we share business tips, interview experts, and travel the world. This week on Two Dudes, Three Legs. Welcome back to Two Dudes, Three Legs Podcast with your host, Anthony Capoletti. Zach Dingy. Today, because it is Limb Loss Awareness Month, we are putting a spotlight on another amputee. We got a badass amputee. My boy, Nick Young. He's a bilateral adaptive athlete. He's a father and he is a hacker, which is incredible. I just had a little conversation with him about the work that he does, and I have never felt so stupid before. <laughs> this man every is a other genius. Word, every other I know, word I, had, I was Googling what he was saying to try to keep up. So Nick, it's, it's good to see you, man. Thank you, Tony. Great Thanks for coming on the show. podcast. To give people a little bit of background, we met for the first time in Denver at a Levitate test run. That's right. Yeah. The first time that I had ever, you know, ran with any other amputees was in Denver at the test run. That was the first time you put on the blade legs? I put on my blade legs about two weeks before because Beforehand. I okay. actually got the grant from the Heather Abbott Foundation nice. right around Thanksgiving of 2022. Okay. So I was a couple of weeks in, you know, for the test run, but I certainly was not as good as I thought that I could be. The test run really gave me the experience to kind of stretch my legs a little bit. Ah, pun intended, right? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, that was fun out in Denver. Denver was crazy. Pook was there. I was at Denver. I wasn't at Boston, which you guys just had this week. How was that event? Boston was fantastic. You know, as far as... That was as, the biggest turnout so far. I was going to say, the, the Levitate crew actually told me they thought, you know, Dallas might have had slightly more signups. Um, and the room is a little bit smaller at Boston, which kind of changed the feeling of the whole event. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, we had people who came in uh, some of them because they had seen some of the videos I'd produced with the Levitate team told me this is why they showed up and they had tremendous doubts you know, about whether or not they could run when they first came into the event. But by the time we were done, they were sprinting across the field. And I think that's what's magical to me. It's like you see people who haven't been able to run in 30 years. It's the story we see over and over and over again with Levitate. It's just an incredible impact they're having on the amputee community. They they're come even in, they building crush a it. community like with people like us. Like we made so many friends now with, uh, you know, we got the amputee mafia chat on Instagram, Do you really? which is hard for me to keep up with. Yeah, you would have been invited, but you got legs. Loser. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, no meat legs in the Ant Mafia chat. <laughs> Fair. No meat legs, he Fair said. Fair game. So just so everybody knows, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but a lot of people might not know what it means. Uh, Nick is a bilateral amputee, meaning he had both of his feet amputated. Uh, can you give us a story about how you came to be, uh, and I believe you started as a single amputee and then a bilateral. That's Can you correct. tell us that story? Yeah, so honestly, it's a wild one. I have a genetic connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which underlies all of my conditions. And one of the things that I found that helped with that was low impact, high cardio sports. Mm. Think cycling. Yeah. And right. so for several years, I was an avid city cyclist in Chicago. And unfortunately, I was wearing a very heavy backpack. I was coming under uh, an underpass and the road was clear, completely smooth from my point of view. Unfortunately, that was not accurate to the lay of the road. There was a giant pothole underneath the water that I couldn't see. Ugh. I went over the handlebars and my right leg was tangled in the frame of my bike. At that point, I didn't immediately amputate it. However, me and my leg became two very different neurological components. Mm. What, how does, it got stuck inside the bike and what broke your ankle, your leg, your, what is it? Like it what? tore most of the soft tissue. It didn't it. actually damage many of the bones, but it tore a lot of the soft tissue. And if you know anything about how your ankle works, you know that it's a ton of bones connected by a network of ligaments and tendons. Mm -hmm. It's effectively an evolved hand, a hand evolved for walking. You right. know? Yeah. That's fundamentally what your foot is. And so it's way more complicated than it really has any need to be from a biological point of view. And so at that point, once I, you know, damaged all the ligaments, my ankle would just collapse anytime I tried to walk on it. Now, my pain tolerance is so high that I really didn't immediately know the extent of the damage that I had done. Mm. 
Mm. I walked on it, you know, back home. I walked on it for, you know, probably a couple of months before I realized the pain was just excruciating with every step. Now, how does your syndrome fit into all of this though? So if anything to do with collagen, uh, okay, so typically that's has why a huge role to play. So easily, okay, exactly. Fundamentally, I, I describe living with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome like living in a house of poorly fried bricks, bricks mm. that just kind of randomly crumble that you don't have any control over. And so, when my collagen stretches, it never returns to its original form. It has what they call micro tears in there, and those micro tears ensure that it never fully heals the same way that someone else's collagen, you know, structures might. And it's not a thing that I can take collagen supplements to fix because my body has a bad genetic code. It's effectively like if the blueprint for your house had a number of critical flaws in it and you didn't catch it. Right. And so you There's have to live with that do. the rest of the time that you're in that house. Wow, because as soon as you said it, my first thought was, can you just take collagen or inject it somehow or do something, stem cells, whatever, but... I can, I mean, but it's not that my body would know how to structurally use those proteins that I gave it. Wow. And That's so, you know, within a couple of years, um, I had actually developed very aggressive CRPS. Yeah. Um, and I know you guys have had a couple of guests on the show the with last that condition. Guest, one of the last guests I just sat with had CRPS and they call it the uh, suicide syndrome. Because yeah. Because you're in such pain that some people, you know, obviously go that route to deal with it. And it's like a silent, invisible ailment that nobody knows about which makes it even worse. And the wild thing is for, for me, you know, I had about a year or two of that kind of like silent suffering. And then, you know, some mornings after that, when it got really bad, I would wake up, my foot would have swelled up to about twice the size of what it was before. If I got in the shower, um, cold water would feel hot, hot water would wow. feel cold. And then if it wasn't running water, if it was like droplets of water landing on my foot or ankle, it would feel like shards of glass were being planted in my foot. That's crazy. It was, it's incredible. It, and, I, and in the most you know, terrifying way I can think of, it's like your body just doesn't know what to do with that normal stimuli that it would understand as like touch sensation or wet sensation or cold or hot. It's like all those wires are crossed in a way that your body just doesn't know how to process. And correct me wow. if I'm wrong, but doctors can't even explain it. They don't know why, right? No. Um, and in fact, that's, that's like, scary. Imagine you had an issue and you go to the doctor and they're like, yeah, we know what this is. It's CR, CRPS, but we don't know what causes it and we don't know what to do about it. Holy fuck. Yeah, bro. Now, the one thing that I will say that saved me is that at the core, I'm an engineer. I know how to read medical papers. I know how to interpret scientific literature. And I found a number of medical papers that indicated that if I had a damaged portion of the nerve, that I could potentially cut that off and save my leg and save myself all the misery that I've been going through. Mm. Now, I say if there is a nerve injury, because that's the critical bit, you can also develop CRPS from something that is not an inciting injury where your body fundamentally takes something that shouldn't hurt you and reacts vastly negatively, overreacts negatively to it. Mm. And so if you had, you know, a cut on your foot or whatever, there's actually a chance that you could develop CRPS from something very minor like that. Does it injure the nerve? Does it fundamentally alter the function of your leg? No, but your body's overreaction to it that's what modifies, you know, the, the process of the condition. But in my case, um, I believe, you know, based on the medical literature that I was reading that the constant dislocations of my ankle had likely damaged, you know, many of the nerves in my ankle. And I thought it's worth a shot, you know, let's go to the doctors and let's just see. They've tried four, you know, four or five different methods of, of treatment, bracing, surgery, um, they actually had to repair my, my knee at one point because it had gotten so bad walking on that, you know, busted ankle. And after all of that, you know, had failed just dramatically and it kept hurting worse and worse with every surgery. I told them, I said, I need you guys just cut it off. That's crazy because a lot of that relates to the last podcast I was on as well with Sam Schaefer. Um, he had the same syndrome. CRPS, CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome. syndrome. Okay. So he had the same syndrome. And it was the same case where amputation wasn't the bad part of it. It was actually the cure 
to the issue, which is such a crazy thing. Cause me, for me, amputation, like my accident resulted in amputation, your accident resulted in immediate amputation as like it needed to happen. Yours was like, it needed to happen much further down the road, but to fix the problem, I guess it kind of is the same. Same shit, just delayed. Yeah. Yeah. But delayed, but it's like, here's the difference. I was not looking forward to my amputation. You probably really were. It was, it was like life-saving, you know? I knew, honestly, about a year out from the injury, probably mid-2016, late, you know, early 2017, like, I knew that the amputation was fundamentally in my cards because at the time, I was watching a number of people online go through this journey. And I, I actually think, um, if my memory serves me, that, like, my amputation and Footless Joe's amputation were actually relatively within the same time frame. And so while she was going through some of that process, I was watching folks, you know, like her on the other side of it being like, okay, this is, this could be my, my savior. Right. This could be the chance to get my life back. Right. Against this backdrop too, I had just had my first child Sloan in early 2016. And I was so frustrated because I couldn't be the parent that I wanted to be. I was putting much more work on my partner than I really needed to be able to do. And I couldn't, you know, effectively take my kid out and go play for a whole afternoon. That's tough. We live in Colorado. Playing outdoors is what we do. Right. And so if I, if I cut my leg off and it gave me the chance to be a better dad, you know, there's no question. Right. So you have to amputate the one leg, which you end up doing. I do. What's the story with the other leg and how come that had to go? Was it the same reason? So somewhat similar. I mean, I think honestly, I was probably putting a lot more force on what I thought was my sound leg at the time. Mm -hmm. Again, though, to realize that, you know, any joint that's made out of a significant amount of collagen is likely going to fail long term. You know, I, I felt like I just kind of overworked it. Mm -hmm. I I pushed it way too hard. Um, If anything, you know, my problem is that I I go way too hard and I don't really recognize that I'm going to pay long-term consequences because of that. Uh, But it's like, if if there's a job to be done, let's do it. I mean, when I was in my twenties, you know, living in Chicago, I would help friends move routinely knowing what I know now. And if I had been educated properly by the doctors growing up, I wouldn't have made those decisions. I wouldn't have hurt myself, you know, to benefit someone else. And that's not to say that like, I regret any of the things that I've done, but there's ways in which I could have been there as a friend besides hauling heavy things up the stairs with you, you know? That is wild to comprehend because you're literally out helping people, just simple tasks that normal, that you would normally do. And then because of, the more you do those tasks, the more implications it's gonna have to your body. So like long-term, you said, all those joints have the potential to fail. Is there prevention now? Obviously, both your legs are empty. What about like hands, wrists, shoulders, anything like that? I still have a considerable amount of problems, you know, with hands, wrists, shoulders. Yeah. Um, my spine looks like a giant corkscrew. Ugh. I'd be about two inches taller if they actually straightened me out. Really? So, I mean, yeah, I'm, I still have a lot of major joint problems, but, um, you know, knock on wood, I'm not going to have any more issues with my legs because I actually had them graft my tibia and fibula together below my knee. Oh, wow. It's called an ertal uh, amputation. Technically speaking, when they just cut it off, you know, two chopsticks at the end, yep. that is called a Burgess amputation. And that's what's classically done for most people. Right. However, the Ertl uh, procedure was actually developed, you know, back during one of the last world wars as a means of giving av- post-war amputees better function. And huh. so for me, it wasn't necessarily about like better function, but about, okay, I've consistently had unstable knees. If you graph my tibia and fibula together, then my knee is going to be stable practically forever. I'm surprised I wouldn't just do that for everyone. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Why isn't that more common to do that surgery? That then? should be the standard. It actually requires kind of a specialized technique. Um, so there's actually probably more complications. Yeah, I'd say I mean, the healing time is a little bit longer. Mm. Um, I mean, most of the folks I know who had a traditional style amputation, they don't have that um, bone swelling to deal with. And so they're actually able to get their prosthesis a lot quicker. But for me, um, I felt like that was the better long-term solution because I'd already had so much trouble with my knees and I wanted to run. I wanted to like be able to go out and perform at the peak of my game. Um, 
and so yeah, you're asking me, you know, once once the first one went, yeah, I immediately went back to everything that I that I could do before. Um, I tried to ride my bike because, of course, you got to go back to the horse that threw you. Mm-hmm. I did some really dumb shit though. Um, I would do things like you know, Velcro my foot to the pedal. Yeah, <laughs> smart until you're falling over. Well, the problem was I didn't have the <laughs> rotational strength to really come out of a traditional clipless system. Yeah, and so I thought maybe there's some sort of halfway point here. Yeah, Velcro my foot to the pedal, and then when I would try to stop and undo the Velcro with you know while I'm still riding, I would then crash into a tree. <laughs> <laughs> And I went into my PTs the next visit and I told them and they said, dude, we're going to give you a third wheel. Like you just, you just need a third wheel. And so I actually started investigating, you know, recumbent cycling on a tricycle at that point. And that's the one where you sit back. Exactly. You sit back, you're stable, feet not in front of you. Yeah. And if you fall, you know, you're maybe a foot from the ground. So it's not anything bad. You get bad. a sick leg pump on yeah, those, those things. Yeah, those bikes look cool as shit, too. I want to get one of those damn things. It's fun. When we, remember when we ran the, you ran the 5K? They started with those bikes. Do you remember that? I thought they had just wheelchair guys. No, they, there was guys in that bike on those bikes, too. What are their bikes called? This is a recumbent tricycle. Recumbent tricycle. Whatever, it doesn't matter. But before no. we ran the 5K, they, yes, no, they were. They had, they had the wheelchairs with the, with the one wheel out way front. Oh, you're thinking like a racing wheelchair. Yes. Yeah. So this is actually very different. Okay. I have what's they called a tadpole design. very similar. Yeah. They look super similar. So mine is actually a, a tadpole design. It is powered by my feet. Um, and it has two wheels in the front and one in the rear. The power wheel is in the rear. And then the two front wheels are out in front of me, kind of beside me. And they provide, you know, side to side stability. stability. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So um, slightly different. Yeah. It's actually kind of reversed from a racing wheelchair. Um, okay. But once I got that, I went out, I rode like 300 miles. I owe uh, the Limb Preservation Foundation a major thank you for giving me an adaptive sports grant to help partially fund that because, you know, these things are twenty five hundred, three grand. Like it's it's pretty expensive, even just the stock bicycle, you know, modify. And then I have to like modify it, put certain pedals on it and things that work better for me. For you, yeah. Upgrades. But once I found that flow, I rode 300 miles that first year. Holy shit. And that's probably more than, you know, anything I'd ever ridden. The wild thing is that before I never really cared about logging the mileage. I never really cared about saying like, oh, I rode, you know, 50 miles this week or hundred miles this week. It never mattered. But now, now that this is my comeback story. Yeah. But this is chapter two. <laughs> I like that. It matters. The numbers matter. Yeah. yeah. I like that I like a lot. That. Now you even have, you've taken it as far as starting a whole biking crew, right? Yeah. So last year we started uh, the Misfits and the Misfits <laughs> are an adaptive cycling club. Basically the rule for joining the club is if there is something wrong with you that the world says should have stopped you in your tracks. A misfit. And yet you persisted. You are a misfit. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm the only amputee cyclist in the group. Um, but we have, you know, TBI survivors, spinal cord injury survivors, you name it, you know, you're welcome in the group. And Colorado is an apex for adaptive sports. Yeah. yeah. We noticed that too, actually, when we went out there, that's incredible though. And I love the name misfit. I love that name. Let me, I want to ask you, so take me back to you amputate the f- your first leg, you're feeling good. You're like, cool. That's done. I have my other leg now. It's still good. You go back and you said, like, I went hard. Like, you were like, I'm excited. I get to do it again. Yeah. Now you go back. Now you're killing it. And then all of a sudden, that leg deteriorates. And now you have to go and get another leg amputated. So how does that feel? What is your sense of emotion there? Honestly, it, it felt, you know, just soul crushing. It's like I had soared so high. I came back from, you know, something that I fundamentally didn't think was possible. If you'd asked me, you know, six months before, I would have been hopeful to have my leg cut off because I mean, when I came out of surgery, I, I was crying from relief. Mm. Even, even with all like the pain from surgery and everything, I was crying from relief because for the first time in many years, I didn't feel any pain. Right. Like, I didn't CRPS know what it was, was like gone. to live without that. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, even when I would go under for surgery on my knee or some other body part, it was still there. You know, they've got you all hyped up on the morphine or the fentanyl or whatnot. And I can still tell that my foot is on fire. Like it, the traditional drugs just really didn't do anything for that. And so, you know, they're doing surgery on my knee or what have you, but like my foot is still just burning up. And so once I, once I realized like that, 
I was going to have to have my, my second leg amputated. I, I was crushed. Um, I mean, I think there's actually a post on my Instagram, you know, where I was out riding and every time my left foot would go up and over that crank, it would catch and then fall through and then snap very loudly with every revolution. So I knew like, I mean, I damaged something in there. I could not, I could not do the pedal motion without the joint in my ankle actually locking up and then needing to like kind of break through and fall through. So it was very obvious to me, like what the solution was. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want people to try to rebuild it. Um, but it took me a couple of times to find the right surgeon who was willing to do it because, yeah. and I'm sure like, you know, Tony, maybe you know this, that cutting off a leg for a surgeon is like game over. It feels like they failed. Like mm -hmm. we didn't have anything else to give you, but to cut your leg off. Right. And, and now once we cut your leg off, you know, there's nothing else that we can do. There's no way for us to help you as doctors. You know, your life is over. Yeah, but there's so many, there's, you know, then they turn you over to an orthotic office and everything's fine. Yeah. So like, yeah, well, they might have feel like they failed, but the world didn't fail us. There's so many good options now. I mean, Levitate is providing amazing options for us. You know, we both have Falauer All Pros. It's a great option. You know, I don't think, I, I, I understand how they feel that they failed, but... For you, it sounds like the second one wasn't as good, but it was a success. Look at you now. Tremendously. Yeah. I mean, and, and there has never been a moment, you know, to this day that I have considered it the wrong decision. Right. I had to go in for a very minor revision surgery on the left side because they actually messed up the bone graft and left about a quarter inch sticking out the side of my leg. Uh. My prosthetics team, you know, tried very hard to make that fit and work for me, but it just fundamentally was something they couldn't work around. Yeah, and yeah. so after, you know, about a year of trying to get the proper prosthetics fit and everything on the left side, I went back into a trauma surgeon who is actually, you know, now kind of a friend of mine and I've worked with before. And I told him, I'm like, you know, I really need you to just fix this up so that I can go back to doing what I want to do. Because again, I feel like I've hit this plateau. Like I've, I'm off this high of being able to do all these things again. Yeah. But then I suddenly would plateau again. And any time that you've come back from something, you know, so radical, when you hit that plateau, it's just devastating yeah. because you know what your potential is. You know where you can go. Well, you had two comebacks then. You're on your second one. <laughs> yeah. Two for two, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> now you said earlier, that you, with your disease, you were told to have low impact, high volume sport, like cycling. High cardio. High yeah. cardio, sorry. But isn't that what led to all your amputations was because you were bicycling so much? I thought in the beginning you said that that was supposed to help. Well, the bicycle accident. Yeah, the accident it? was definitely the precipitous Correct, but event. then your other leg. But then once, the thing is, once my right leg was amputated, it, it was fundamentally now, you know, not my sound leg, but probably one of the better ones. And so I, I pushed it so far. Got like it. Okay. So it didn't the have additional to do stress it. on the left side. It just fundamentally couldn't hold together. It makes sense. And okay. that's probably from the years of walking on a collapsed ankle on the right side, even pre amputation, yeah. because there was many years where I was trying to convince the doctors, you know, late 2016 through late 2018, when they finally did it in October, I was trying to convince the doctors, you guys, you need to cut this off. You need to rebuild it for me because the other side is going to fail. We're, we're simply on a ticking clock. Yep. It's going to fail. And so it was a matter of like when, not if. Once they fixed the right one, you know, I hoped that it wouldn't have to go through with the amputation on the left side. I, I wanted nothing more than to just kind of like be done with surgery. But if I could have one or two more surgeries and then go back to the quality of life that I had without having another leg that hurt, no brainer, you know? Yeah. How long were you on just the one leg amputee? What was that time frame? So I had my right one amputated October of eight, 2018 and then the left one lasted until probably the tail end of 2019 and then it so was by January. You didn't even have enough time to fully adjust at, as no. uh, one, you know, with one leg. No, I didn't. And the thing is, I was when I would ride. I mean, I was putting so much power into the cranks yeah. that it's just like I would, I would actually cause my left ankle to kind of wobble. Ugh. There's many like photos and things that I'm sure I can pull out of the archive where you guys will see I'm riding with one prosthetic on the right side, and my left ankle is wrapped up in like a compression boot to try Ugh. to just hold it together. Wow. 
Well, now, you know, it's a success story, obviously. Now you've got two good working prostheses. You're, you're running around on levitate blade legs. Your, your limb loss challenge was one of the most badass ones I've seen so far. <laughs> Thank you. Guys fucking hopping around on a levitate blade leg. That was a badass video. I did keep my other all pro on my left side though, in case I needed to sit a foot down. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the problem with the bilateral. You like you, you don't have an extra foot to sit down. Right. It's all prosthetics. Um, and now how, how have you adjusted as a bilateral? Cause from, from the outside viewpoint, it looks like you're living just a perfectly normal life, man. You know, you're working and every time I see you, you're, you just seem fine. No, it's great. I mean, life, life is what it should be now. Good. Um, I, I will admit, I mean, there was definitely a, you know, a year or so period where I had to kind of walk with a cane and learn to adjust. Um, but now my prosthetics clinic, you know, back in whatever it was, I think maybe January of this year, um, they were telling me, you know, you can probably ditch the cane and we can make some adjustments to your prosthetics that'll help you have a more solid footing. And so I, I found, you know, very helpful prosthetics clinics over the years that'll kind of push me to go a certain direction. Mm. The, the main, you know, deciding factor is whether or not that's a direction that I want to go. Right. If that's a direction that I feel like I can personally walk and it's not just for their own benefit. Um, but now, I mean, I'm working with the folks at agile and they've got a number of like really great prosthetists on staff. And so if there's something that I ask, I'm like, you know, this is a problem for me. They actually would kind of modify my legs to get me there. And so I think probably since, well, yeah, maybe since probably January or February, I mean, I've been without my cane or anything, unless I'm doing very aggressive hiking uphill, mind you, in right. Colorado. <laughs> That's so badass that you even do that. Um, all right. Well, your, your story as an amputee is fascinating, uh, but there's a whole nother side of you that I think is also extremely entertaining to hear about. You are a hacker. That's right. Yeah. So, and I a think good hacker, the, mind a you. funny coincidence to me is when I first met you, I was like, wow, this guy, this guy reminds me of Edwards. What is it? Edward Snowden is his name. I get that quite frequently, actually. Yeah, I mean, that's a compliment, <laughs> dude. That guy is one of the most badass patriots of all time. Uh, so to, to be compared to him, you should certainly take it as a compliment. I do. Uh, but tell us a little bit about what being a hacker actually is, because when you know, when people hear that, their first thought is, all right, we're hacking into the mainframe and it's like an Ocean's Eleven fucking scene or something like that. And I think it's a big misconception of what you actually do uh, through work. Tell us about the job itself and then tell us how you got into that. So, I mean, what I am right now is I'm director of information security at a crypto startup. And one of my primary responsibilities is to ensure that not only the software that we're delivering is secure, is written in kind of the best practices for that particular language that we're working in, but also to control the environments under which that software operates. Um, so I'm basically in charge of anything, you know, secret management, and, but also kind of, you know, proactive defense. So if I see something that I think is a potential exploit that someone else might exploit, I go ahead and take the initiative to exploit that myself, to find the solution, to patch it up and then ship it. And often, you know, tell the story either internally or to the public about what we did, because I think that's the main thing that's missing right now. You know, you hear everyone says like, oh, I saw in Hollywood someone hack into the mainframe. My role right now is largely as an educator. Because I think as we move into the future, as digital technology takes a bigger and bigger role in our lives, mm. we're going to have to understand it like at first principles. And many people just, you know, seeing what's on television and assuming that that's fact, um, the, the real, you know, truth of the work is it's, it couldn't be further from that. It's mostly about, you know, proactive defense, understanding where you think the vulnerabilities are, actively exploiting them to yourself and then incredibly clear communication about how you protect against that vulnerability. So to dumb that down for some people, because it took me a while to understand what you meant by that, is like, essentially you have a software and you sit on the outside of it and try to break in and find exactly. its weak points. So it'd be like me sitting outside of this building and trying to open that door from the outside, open this window from the outside, and then exposing all the weak points so that whoever owns the building can can protect it further. Exactly. And it's and funny because I crazy. grew up doing, you know, traditional alarm systems and security and then kind of took that into the cybersecurity space because I realized that 
more and more, you know, products were actually going to be software driven. Mm. And so now, I mean, even many networks in the government are actually run on top of a spec they call SD-WAN, software defined wide area network. So it's not a piece of, you know, hardware with physical plugs in it that controls the shape and the functionality of the network. It is software that then runs on a router that actually controls the topography of the network. Wow. And so <laughs> more and more, like it's going to be, what do you write? Where does it run? What secrets does it need in order to function? And that's an interesting thing too, is that like at work right now, you know, what I do is I not only um, offensively attack our software and our infrastructure, I work with external partners who do that as well to kind of give a wider purview. Because yeah. again, I'm so close to the problem, there's gonna be things that I can't see. Of course. And so my goal is to try to basically minimize as many of those like potential pain points that I can by getting the widest, um, the widest purview, the widest view on that problem that I can. Right. Now, how did you get into this line of work? Because for me, I couldn't even imagine like for me, I don't even, wouldn't even think that they have people trying to find problems in their system. They're paying you to see what's wrong with it by like you acting as a bad guy. That's such a wild concept to me. But how do you get into this line of work? Real quick for you, answer. you know what I was just thinking? You know how every, there's a saying is like, oh, my dad's not a rocket scientist. Your dad is a fucking electrical engineer, so it only makes sense <laughs> that he would get into this yeah. industry. So that you know? obviously had something to do yeah. with it. But yeah. tell us, tell us the the a path. self-taught electrical engineer too, which Your is part of the was story. A self-taught electrical engineer, yeah. self-taught uh, electrical you. and RF engineer. Yes, and so very, at a very early age, you know, um, he would involve me in like circuit design and you know building the projects that he was building. By the time I was in elementary school, I, I realized that I wanted to pursue amateur radio because. I, I've, I had a huge heart for public service. We lived in a very tornado prone area. And so I thought what better way, you know, to utilize these skills that I have to go get my amateur radio license, to learn to be a storm spotter from the National Weather Service and to try to, you know, use some of these skills that I have to kind what of forward the goal of public safety. Good way to put that silky voice to work. Yeah, so. <laughs> Ladies um, and gentlemen, there's gonna be a storm. You're gonna I, wanna bunker up. The wild thing is that actually, you know, many cases, um, I would try to be out in front of the storm and actually identify the communities that I thought it was going to impact. And then I would relay that message directly to the National Weather Service over the amateur radio, which again, because it's not just, you know, you dial it up on the cell phone, it's an FCC licensed mode of communication dedicated to forwarding the art of radio experimentation. That's what amateur radio is. Like, it's... No, 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 no. Like, I mean, it's, I mean, that's the thing is you have to go get a license from the FCC in order to be able to talk on these bands. Wow. But the idea is that we don't ever want to lose the expertise of how to create and operate, you know, radios that are not traditionally baked into your cell phone. Right. Because if, when shit hits the fan, that's going to probably be the best way of communication, right? Fundamentally. I mean, I was in Biloxi, Mississippi shortly after Katrina came ashore. All of the cell phone networks were offline, um, but we had a hundred watt radio in our truck. We were down there doing, you know, rebuilds after Hurricane Katrina, and we were also passing traffic from families in the area who couldn't communicate with their loved ones up north. Mm. And their loved ones up north, you know, sometimes as far as New England, fundamentally didn't even know if the people who lived down on the coast were okay. Yeah. Right. We're and alive. so, <clears throat> for me, having the ability to use these you know, high power radios on bands that many people don't talk on. Um, you know, we actually, we form what we call a communications net. And so anytime some type of natural disaster is going on, usually amateur radio operators are the first people to step into that void and say, you know, if you don't know what's going on in this area, we're going to go there. We'll even operate our radios off generators if we have to right. in order to do that. And you get hit by an EMP. Are you going to be able to use a radio? That's a good question. I mean, many, a lot of radios are probably somewhat shielded against that um, because you're actually creating RF energy inside the chassis of the radio. So it would probably depend on the, the types of systems that I had at my disposal at that time. But more likely, like let's say Russia hits us with a massive EMP, we're most likely just going to resort to radio. You'll have to. You'll almost have to because, I mean, the, anything that is software defined, 
in this Go case, on. many of the you know cell phone networks. Again, I talked about the idea of like a software defined network. Yeah, that's essentially what many of these modern you know cell phone communication protocols are. It's like the radio is simply a medium. The frequent, you know, the 900 megahertz or a gigahertz or whatever that your phone's talking on, that's, that's simply a medium. The protocol, the way that the data is packed along that like communication channel, that's, what, that's why cell phones are so powerful is because they can actually do um, what they call TDMA, time delayed multiple access. And so it's a protocol at every cell phone base station that del- you know, basically multiplexes all of your multiple phone calls across the area onto a single tower. Wow. If you're at home, please make sure you have your dictionary handy. You will need it during the rest of these questions for this podcast. So when you say the word hacker, uh, um, I'm sure people have a lot of questions and we were talking about some stuff before. So let's ask some questions about what, if you have a hacker in front of you, what can you do? What are the possibilities? What are crazy questions that people always ask you? Which one is the EMP? Another one we were just talking about, which I want you to talk about as well, is like, can you hack an Instagram or a Facebook or get on there and go in and give me 10,000 followers or something like that? Yeah. So the question, would I'd say that's probably twofold. One, can you hack Facebook or Instagram? Absolutely. Um, in so fact, you do 10,000 people want to follow me. Can you hack <laughs> Facebook and Instagram? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, yes. <laughs> and, and the thing is, you, you, you'll actually see a number of YouTubers, you know, probably over this last year alone that have had, you know, their channels deleted or um, mm. random live streams go up. Basically, what they're doing is they're stealing what they call a session token. And that is a v- traditionally very long string that is serves as kind of a an API access key, a token that if you can pass this to the service over a secure channel, like, you know, HTTPS. So anytime your browser says HTTPS, Mm -hmm. suddenly that means that you have a secure cryptographic channel from your computer to to the server. server. And in theory, that connection, if it is broken, you would be notified. Now, that depends on the specific, you know, security configuration of every piece of software in that trust chain. So your goal is to sneak in without anyone seeing you get in there. Exactly. Now you're in the middle of that interaction and you can ac- you can access information from one side to another, potentially change it. Yes. If I, if I ever, like when you, okay, I'm Tony, I'm a login with my Instagram credentials. At that point, the server is then going to verify, okay, are these credentials even valid? And if, and if yes, it's going to give you basically an API token token. Yeah. And that token also comes along with what they call a refresh token. So not only do you have your session token, you're actually like your API access key, but you have a refresh token that says, okay, anytime this one expires, give me a new one within these same permissions. And so if I could steal both your access token and your refresh token, I am you. And I am you probably indefinitely until you deauthorize all That's of your devices. That's the TV moment where they go, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. I'm in. <laughs> they look back at the boss. <laughs> and the thing is, though, on, on you know, Hollywood movies, like they just kind of tap at the keyboard and then suddenly they're in. Right. But it's like in real life, the, the attack is not particularly that difficult to pull off. It's about, okay, can I man in the middle this Without request being seen. can i put myself in yeah in between you and the service that you care about without being seen mm. and there's tremendously more value if i can sit there silently for a long time without ever doing anything because i can lull you into a false sense of security you don't think you've been owned <laughs> but then 3 months later you that's own Q, when I put up you the, own Q29 Studios all of a sudden. Make sure it. this guy doesn't leave anything mm-hmm. plugged in. <laughs> what do you think about the the current situation with any platform that you go on with the username and password? Is that is that strong enough to keep people safe, or do you think it's kind of bullshit that just passes? So there's kind of two ways to answer that. One, like yes, it, it is reasonable security if you pair it with a very long password. Mm. So I'm, I'm talking, you know, probably 20 plus characters between oh, wow. most of my passwords are between 24 and 32 characters. Holy shit. Um, and in a minute, I'll actually give you guys a, a demo of, of a piece of software that will uh, perhaps make this a little bit clearer. In fact, if you want to pull up your phone and Google password haystack generator, this will show you uh, effectively how making the password longer makes it more difficult to crack. 
If you pair that with two-factor auth, I'll say, um, you're vastly more secure because it then, at least then, you know, when you try to log in, assume someone steals your credentials, mm -hmm. the service is then going to ask you for a second factor. Right. All of a sudden you get a text message. Yeah, a text message right. or um, a push notification. I actually am not necessarily a fan of those. I much prefer to use what they call a YubiKey, which is like a USB device that sticks in the side of your computer or touches the back of your phone and uses NFC. It's never connected to the internet. That's what I use as my second factor. So a physical password. Yes, essentially, it's, it's, it's basically, the idea is pairing your credentials, something that you know, with your actual physical, like YubiKey, your second factor hardware device. Yes, yeah, so nobody can get your, they would have to know all your information and have that piece of physical. Yes, and at any point, if you ever lost that, what you do, or what I do anyway, is I actually have two YubiKeys. One that I use that I carry with me for most of my physical access, and then a second one that is also paired to all of the same accounts. So my Google account, my mm -hmm. Facebook account, my Instagram, what have you. And then I lock that one away in a safe. So that if so I have ever there. have any trouble out in the world, I lose my YubiKey, right. I go back to the safe, and I can then say, okay, that old YubiKey, I wipe it from any account so that suddenly it can't be used as a second factor. It can't be used against you anymore, right. Exactly. Now, people would still have to have both things. They still have to have something that I know, the credential, and something that I have, the YubiKey. Yeah. But All right. so I don't want to give them more chances. This begs the question, what the fuck are you hiding? <laughs> 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 All right, so I got this website you said to pull up, and what I can do is just put my password or a password in and just see how strong it is. Exactly. And it's going to tell me how much better exponentially better. It looks like it's showing it as an ex an exponent. Yes. Now this so, will show, and this will so, show you basically how long it would take a traditional computer system. The one of the, uh, anything right now, you know, any traditional system like you'd be editing video on or uh -huh. all the way up to a supercomputer, it'll show you basically how long any sort of sequential cracking algorithm would take to break that password. Break, okay, so if my password is capital P, password. <laughs> we'll see what that's like, password. Oh, and it's giving me like a rating. The word password. Yeah, password. So it's saying exact search space size, 54. I don't even know what that number is. So that's going to give you all of the possible alphanumeric Oh my God, online attack scenario, 17.33 centuries to crack password? Now that would- No, no, that no, basically below assumes, it, nine minutes. Oh, offline fast attack there scenario, you go. nine minutes. Massive crass, cracking array scenario, 0.545 seconds to crack that. I could probably crack that in a few seconds on my local workstation. Now, what's potentially notable, though, is that if you keep adding, say, periods yeah, or stars see. or some right. character that so you would think add, are kind of so useless. So we go from 0.54 seconds, 0.545 seconds, you add one exclamation point and it jumps to 39 minutes. Yeah. Now you add wow. another exclamation point, 2.31 days. You add a money sign. 6.46 months. So Holy that's why crap. they tell you to do those little extra things. Yes. Now let's just put one more letter. 1.74 centuries. With a number six. Just one more number. But you see basically how increasing the length of the string matters even more than the characters you're putting into right. that. Right, right. So basically what you're doing is you're trying to create a large enough pile of entropy. Let's see how strong Enough stuff is. that computer would have what, to sort what's through. What's your password? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. That's a good Type one. that one in there. No <laughs> comments. <laughs> no, that's very interesting. And the name of the website again is, uh, for if you guys want to try this at home, it's pretty cool. What was the name of it again? This is, this is put together by the Gibson Resource Corporation. Yeah, okay, so grc.com yeah. is where I'm on. That's cool. And what you're basically, what you're trying to defend against is that offline massive cracking scenario. Anything that you see, when they say they say online cracking, they mean I have to then ask the service, right? And say, hey, is this password correct? And at some point, if the person running that service is intelligent and is aware of the security threats, they're gonna cut me off as a user. Right, that's Nick. why you see a lot of times they'll ask, you get three tries and yes. then it's like, you're out. Nick, how long before we all die from AI? Ooh. Oh man. Over under a year. Be honest. Over. <laughs> all right. We're good. We're good. That's all I need. Tell me about chat GPT and open AI. What are your thoughts? 
It is revolutionary technology that will someday need to be open in order to properly validate how it functions. Need to, uh, it will need to down? be open. So part of the reason that software like the Linux kernel, right, is so secure. Linux is the probably most widely deployed commercial operating system for servers likely in the world. Okay. Um, if you're talking to Facebook or Instagram, they're not running Windows under the hood. They're running Linux. Okay. Linux is basically a hacker's OS uh, created many years ago by Linus Torvalds and now is fundamentally the standard for any sort of like software development or deployment environment. So if you were to just go to, you know, any server provider and say like, I want to buy a server, or I so want to like rent Twitter one. Twitter running on that. Twitter is running on Instagram, that. Instagram, Facebook, Instagram. all these big companies are running on Linux. They're running on Linux. Okay. Yeah. Because it, it's basically the smallest, you know, operating system that you can get. The idea is you just want to keep the footprint as minimal as you can to keep the attack surface as minimal as you can. Mm, so fundamentally, like I, t I tell people, you know, what's the most secure program? It's the one you never wrote. It's the one that didn't compile. Wow. It's, it's the piece of software <laughs> that you came up with that it didn't work. That's the most secure thing because you never ran it. That's interesting. <laughs> and so if you can fundamentally write less lines of code, make your program less complex, you have less attack surface. Right. And so um, that's, that's basically kind of the idea of Linux is like, you know, something like Windows that has a user interface and many other components on top of it, it's needlessly complex for the data center environment. Right. And to try to explain that to people in an easier way, it's like living in a cave. It's extremely safe because there's one entrance and one exit. Yeah. Whereas you get this big complicated house, you got windows people can sneak in, doors people can sneak in, sort of going back to what I said earlier. Yeah, and but the like defense the for each version. Right, it's just a more complicated thing that's, it gives it more places for the shield to have chinks in it. Exactly, and, and the thing is your defense against window security is probably gonna be very different against your defense for door security. Ah, I didn't even right? think about that. And then what happens if someone walks up to your house and cuts the phone lines? Ah. Like, you know, one of the things we used to do when we were installing security systems is we would have a 3G backup in the event that someone walked up to the house and cut the phone lines because we always wanted that security system to be able to report back to our monitoring company. Right. And so that's why, I think that's why people, you know, use Linux. It's, it's, widely, um, it's widely deployed, but it's also open. So it does, Linux did something that Mac OS or Windows or no other, you know, really operating system has ever done in that they developed the entire, um, the kernel, the nugget of, you know, the, the nugget of operating system that kind of controls all of the other software on the, on the computer. They developed that in the open. Now, what do you mean by in the open exactly? You could go browse the source code on GitHub right now. Right. Okay. So without very, even logging okay, in. So that's what you mean by open. It's completely visible. There's no secrets in it. Exactly. And part of why I like things that are open is because we have all the engineers in the world looking at it. You, and so therefore right. you so fundamentally have some smart upon. people. Right. Exactly. They can prove exactly that the program, when you compile it and run it, it does exactly this thing. Now, mind you, I could compile Linux in a malicious environment and I could kind of sneak some things in during that compilation process. But as long as you trust the environment where that software was compiled from source into binary, mm. then you can trust that platform as a whole. Inter that's super interesting stuff, dude. Um, I, I do, I had this question for you earlier and I wanted to ask it because like, as a hacker, what like, if you wanted to go in and really hurt a company, like say Twitter, because fuck Twitter, actually not fuck Twitter, Elon Musk is the man, but fuck old Twitter. Um, let's say you wanted to do it. How do you actually hurt them? Like what does a hacker do to hurt them? Like you go in and what, change their code so nothing works anymore? Or like, what is the point? What what advantage could assume. someone gain by hacking into Twitter servers? There is likely probably no, you know, personal data really stored on Twitter. So I'd say, I'd start there. Like, is there, is there something that you particularly feel is of value to you as the attacker? And for Twitter, I, I mean, most people's feeds are probably public. Like, I don't particularly think that like stealing information so would saying, be a value. Okay, so, so then that makes it clear that the, 
the most that you can gain is information. Yes. Right? You're not going in there to transfer money from this account over to your own account. That's not what a hacker's looking to do. No, no, not usually. Most most of the time it's just disrupt the service. It's to make it so difficult that they would then pay you ransom in order to stop griefing them. Mm. Ah. In fact, that's that's still the number one, you know, attack against many small businesses is Here's a piece of software. It has now infiltrated your environment. Everything on your computer is locked up, um, and it's encrypted in on, with only keys that the hackers know. So they're holding your stuff hostage. Yeah, I mean, when I when I was living in Chicago, I can't tell you it was probably once a week that one of my friends' small businesses would be hit with ransomware. And you're helping them? Oh, it's got a name, ransomware. Yeah. And then what? They call they call Nick, and they're like, "Fix this." Most of the time, there's really not a whole lot that I can do if you've got a very significant ransomware installation. If it's pretty far progressed to the point that it's like embedded in your system and it's you know locked up or encrypted most of your documents, there's really not a whole lot that I can do. My role is primarily on like prevention and okay, education yeah. because if you never have to deal with that attack, if you never have to respond to it, that's fundamentally worth a lot more to you. Yeah. Now, internally at my work, I have plans that if we ever were exploited by something like that, what we would do fundamentally, we firewall all of our system backups into a separate environment so that the ransomware wouldn't actually be able to jump through the firewall and then encrypt our backups. Mm. And we take, you know, snapshots on the regular so that anytime if, you know, hour to hour, if we were to be infected, we you just roll shut back that an hour. System down. You, you turn on the backup and with all the snapshots, you can pick up right where you left off. Exactly. So we, you know, you roll back by an hour and business continues as usual. Do you think of the human brain as like a server that runs on a code? Like, I always think it's so interesting that I feel like humans are robots. We're just extremely complex silicone based robots. Like our brain runs on a function. It, it's like code in our head telling our lungs, okay, because you you're not voluntarily, well, I guess you are voluntarily breathing, but like there's so much stuff in your body that happens involuntarily that like, do you think it's like code in our mind that runs our bodies? Oh, definitely. I mean, it, it may not execute the same way as a computer executes the software that it runs, but I mean, I just left you know Boston where people ran 26.2 miles and everybody that I've talked to tells me, the game is up here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The he, game is not. Done. The game is not in your legs. It's not in the rest of your body. The game is up here. So I have a follow-up question to that. Then that actually pertains to the salamander thing. So if we run on a function, right? Your body tells you when to grow and when not to grow. You know, you you experience uh, muscle growth when you when you rip your muscles and then they grow back because that's the function of your body. Do you think you could ever trick your brain with code? to then grow your leg back. Think about that. What are you that. typing right there? <laughs> I was writing the code to regrow limb. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like yeah. our body, let's say- Let's try with you. If, if I'll I bring a knife muscle, in every day if I and I'll cut the, your leg open. Well, if I go and to we'll the see gym, what happens. if I go to the gym and I work, I, I tear my muscle, right. the code in my body is gonna say, okay, grow back the muscle and grow back stronger. Yeah, but you got bone in there, bro. You need to grow back, fuck the muscle. Well, how come our brain, well, listen, when you're a baby, your bones are growing because the code in you is saying, okay, grow the bones. So drink more milk. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I wish I had a really concrete answer on that. I'm, I'm not really sure. Listen, it's just I mean, a wild theory. The question is going to be I'm like, asking about like hacking the human genome pretty much. And I, I'm just curious if it's like something, uh, that you think would be possible but how would you even do it? I mean, Neuralink, I guess. Yeah, mm. I mean, what do you think of Neuralink? It's an interesting piece of technology, but it likely needs some more testing. I mean, are you saying the, Elon Musk is stupid? I don't think Elon Musk is stupid. Okay. I think that I think that when it comes to finding the appropriate users for your product, mm -hmm. you're going to have to do a lot of research. I mean, and we're we're finding that out, you know, even working with the folks from Levitate as you know, running blades and stuff like one person puts on a blade and they're going to have a completely different experience than someone else. Yeah. And so if you're talking about brain implants, gosh, you're talking about Have you seen those people who put like keys in their hand or like things to open up safes in their house? You ever yep. seen that? I see that on TikTok all the time. What do you think of that? 
That is actually kind of interesting, although um, there's two different frequency ranges. There's both a high frequency RFID and a low frequency RFID. Mm -hmm. Many people that I know who went to DEF CON and got the little RFID implants actually chose the wrong one and they couldn't open our hackerspace door. Now it's cool. It's really cool. I mean, there's, look, I would love to just be able to force open the door, you know, like Some Darth Vader. Shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but fundamentally like it's cool, but you have to be careful about understanding the technology that you're implanting. Can you in your hack body. that and just like move their hand and shit? So I have, <laughs> when I was in, um, when I was actually at our corporate office in San Francisco, um, couple of months ago, one of the things that I was doing was I actually audited all of the RFID card systems in our building to see if it was spoofable. And um, unfortunately, the answer is yeah. 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 I mean, I, with about $500 worth of hardware, I can spoof any R RFID yeah, because card. because that's how you program it in the first place is just with that $500 piece of equipment. So however you guys are making it, someone else can do it. Exactly. I thought I was going to buy something because I have fobs to get into my house. My key to get into my apartment building. It's just this thing. I could program like anything to do this. Yep. Yeah. No, that's absolutely something you can do. You, yeah, you can buy RFID programmers on like uh, Amazon, can't you? Now, in order to like, you know, decrypt some of the um, private data, because like many of these systems are actually, um, they have a private key on the card. So a lot of them are using what they call the MyFair standard. MyFair actually does have like a, um, uh, an encryption, you know, chip on that card that kind of negotiates the interaction between the reader and the card itself. Mm. The other interesting thing is that those RFID chips don't actually have any power themselves. They function off of inductive power as they approach the reader. That's so interesting. I always wondered that because there's no battery in no. this thing. It's inductive power once you put it up next to the reader. So the reader has to have a power source. Yep. And then it powers the fob yes. through just inductive you're calling it's it. essentially the same thing you see the key you know q, you know, QI wireless charging yeah yeah same deal that's why my fucking door handle electrocutes me all the time probably mm, yep. mm. fucking hate that i get zapped all the time in my building <laughs> unless there's something just wired wrong you know a question i was just about to ask <laughs> sounds but, like i don't want to know but it's stupid <laughs> as fuck but also i swear to god i still don't understand how bluetooth works how the fuck how the fuck do i get in my car how do I get in my car and my phone connects to my car automatically? And I don't have to plug anything in. I don't care what you tell me. It's a simulation and it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you There's paired it, no right? way. Go ahead. You paired it, right? Yeah, but what does that even mean? I paired it to what? So once, so basically the, okay. The funny thing is when my previous company actually found me, I was auditing a Bluetooth vacuum pump that you wear on your prosthetic. Um, you know, sometimes they'll actually suck the air out yeah, of the socket yeah. and that kind of, you, they use that to hold your leg on. Yeah. So these folks had actually made a small Bluetooth pump that Pretty would cool. live in the bottom of your socket where your lock would it's be. Like a pussy pump. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Use that to, um, and use that to basically hold your leg on. And the problem was, um, once I, once my phone had like negotiated the pairing relationship, once my phone and my leg knew, okay, you know, these two things are going to talk to each other. Same thing. You get in your truck, you're, you know, you say, okay, pair my phone to my Bluetooth on the truck. It's going to give you what a six digit code or something to confirm and be mm -hmm. like, okay, this is the device that I'm actually physically sitting in front of. Yes. The numbers match. Great. Proceed. Um, once you go through that process, your phone and the device that you're paired to actually have a cryptographic link. They know each other. Um, and all of all Bluetooth devices Lost actually have me. what's called a Mac address. So a Mac address is like, 4B, 3C, 29AB, whatever. It's usually like a number and a letter. And it's those kind of like four, four different combinations. That's the universal identifier of your, like the hardware in your truck. So your truck has a Bluetooth chip that has a MAC address. Your phone has a Bluetooth chip that has a hardware MAC address. And that's the basically, that, that's the universal identifier of those two devices. And so once you go through the pairing process, you've created a cryptographic link between those two devices. And the moment that they each see each other in RF range, in radio frequency range, they will recognize each other and automatically connect back up. 
So it's radio frequency. Don't tell me you understand that. Well, <laughs> Don't well, tell me you understand that. Was that was your question to, to some degree was he wanted to know just how, what the relationship is. Yeah. What is touching one to the other and it's radio frequency. It's yeah. radios. It's okay. radio. Basically, Bluetooth is built on top of 2.4 gigahertz. And what makes Bluetooth probably the ubiquitous standard for this type of product is that there is a well-recognized implementation standard that was originally created, I think, like at um, Ericsson or Nokia, like back in, back in the very early 80s. You know, Bluetooth is very, is very old, even though the devices and things that utilize it are relatively new, and the specification has had updates over time. But essentially what Bluetooth does is it says, if you're going to send data over the radio, you have to do it in a certain way in order for all of the devices to understand this protocol that we're speaking. Mm. And the interesting thing is that in many cases, like sometimes um, pairing algorithms and things are actually not nearly as secure as you might think. So for instance, like the Bluetooth prosthetic pump that I was auditing, once my phone and the pump had a mutual connection, it was supposed to stop advertising. The pump on your leg was supposed to stop advertising that it could pair to other devices. Right, but it wouldn't. But it wouldn't. And furthermore, it should actually randomize those addresses that are output in the pairing or in the ad, um, advertising requests. And it wasn't doing that. And so once I had any sort of like advertising token from that device, if I had a proper antenna, I could track that patient indefinitely. That's once crazy. you pair, <laughs> once you establish a long-term connection with a device that you own, that you carry on your person, right? It should stop can until you tell that kind of relationship me, is canceled. Can you tell me the most dangerous thing that we do on a regular basis that's just normal but makes it very easy to track us or hack us? Yeah, how are we exposing, how are most people exposing themselves that they don't, in ways that they don't even know? We trust our browsers way too much. Ah, what's your recommendation to save people from that? I would be very careful about the extensions that you install. I mean, I personally use Brave as a browser because I think it blocks a lot of threats, but I don't even really necessarily trust, you know, the implementation of Brave. The idea is that anytime you install a Chrome extension, and again, this may change in the future, but this is kind of the state of where we stand right now, is whenever you install a Chrome extension, it has the same permissions as every other Chrome extension. You can't say, oh, this particular extension can only see, you know, traffic going and from coming from this one website. And so any, if you ever get a malicious extension in your browser, it has access to everything. It has access to everything. Wow. Uh, hmm. Another question I have for you is, you know, I mean, you're a misfit. You said it yourself, right? So you have all this knowledge of how to hack into stuff. What's the worst thing you've ever done with your ability to hack? I mean, I've never done anything that I think is particularly um, malicious. Malicious. I mean, I've, I've always just kind of focused my art on the side of trying to protect people. Uh -huh. And if I am going to actively exploit something, it's going to be under the terms of you really want me to find this before someone with malicious intent does. Right. And fundamentally, like that's that's what we do at work. Can is you like, give you, us a specific story about a time when you found a weak point in a software or a server? Many, many years ago, um, I was actually doing some kind of consulting work on the down low for a private investigator who would go after people that he believed was child pornographers. And at the time, um, this was before, you know, serious encryption on your operating system was kind of commonplace. Um, but we found a way, um, my partner at the time and I, we found a way into a Macintosh laptop and we would fundamentally take the folders that we believe to be the target, pass them along to the private investigator. You know, we, we never looked inside. We didn't, we didn't care to, right. I mean, there's things in there that you just, you don't ever want to see. Um, but yeah, that's, that's probably the wildest thing that we ever did was we actually, so you actually broke into someone's Mac. You found files, you handed them over to the police, and that resulted in this guy's incarceration for child pornography? Yes. Wow. So you're like the, you're like the internet Batman. You got the voice, you got the skills, yeah, you're putting yo, guys in facts. jail. Facts. Can you say vengeance for me one time? <laughs> vengeance. No, oh, that was sex. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. That's amazing. So you actually put someone 
you got someone put away. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Very admirable. I mean, we had to, we basically, you know, we copied the computer as it was. We went and bought an identical Macintosh. We left it in his home. And then we took the actual computer, you know, back to the lab where we could work on it. But the idea was that he had a duplicate, a decoy that nobody would know was any different. That's crazy. Now, again, we had you... access through the private eye, you know, enabled to, in order to do this. Right, because you guys are doing stuff that otherwise you'd be, you would be incarcerated. Yeah, for, for that. Exactly. And Correct. That's, and that's partly why, you know, anytime someone says, okay, well, I, I need you to look at our piece of software. The first thing that I do is I give them a contract and I say, okay, fundamentally my role here, let's be 100% clear, is to be malicious in the way that the bad guys would be but to then turn around and tell you exactly what I did and how to further your defenses as a result. So you're getting permission to be That's the bad wild. guy. That's wild, yeah. That's really cool. That is crazy. I talk about this all the time in businesses, like the intent of why you do something. But the, only, the difference between a crook and a great salesman is just the intent. Right. Because a crook is going to convince you to buy a product that's not good for you, that they're going to do you over for and, and screw you over and a great salesman is just someone who <laughs> does the same thing but for a good product exactly so essentially it's the same exact thing it's like whether or not that salesman intends to follow up and actually deliver you the product that you paid for mm -hmm. that's that's the dividing line correct do you think that the government and these other uh you know police do you think they have a little bit too much power as far as being able to do stuff like that and invade people's privacy? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I'm a bit of a privacy absolutist. So yes, I mean, I fundamentally think that law enforcement probably does have too much power. It's, it's wild. I mean, I grew up in an era where I could tune in to the police frequencies. And this wasn't because I had some type of specific knowledge. I did work with public safety. But it wasn't that I had knowledge that anyone else didn't have. The frequencies yeah, and the broadcast were open. Scanner. Yeah. Could and so that's the thing. I, I grew up in the era of the, of the police scanner, of being able to listen to police and mm -hmm. EMS and fire and understand what was going on in my community. And fundamentally, we've lost that. Like, and I think as a result, we've lost some of the connectedness that people feel with their communities and their local public service. You're not allowed to listen to police channels anymore? In many, in many areas, they're actually encrypted. And in Colorado, if I was to attempt to break that encryption, it would be illegal. Wow. I'm surprised to hear that. I thought you would be able to do that because they're a public, uh, you know, they work for the public. Mm -hmm. The thing is though, and, and again, you, you sit here and you laugh and you all, what have you got to hide? Well, I mean, I mean, I'm sitting here telling you all my secrets. The police though, on the other hand, do mm -hmm. they have something to hide? They very well could. More than likely. And so that, I mean, it's, it's a push to say it's a public safety thing. It's a public service that they're offering, right? That our taxpayer dollars are paying for that we should be able to at least eavesdrop if we cared to. And if you ask me, you know, point blank, do I think that that's something that's, you know, the privacy of the police, do I think that's constitutionally protected? If challenged, I would say likely no, because I think, again, they're a public service. They're right. doing a job for right. us to try to keep our community safe. And I think a large part of the breakdown in trust that we have seen between these public service agencies and the public is probably due to that, due to the fact that they've just kind of continually made it harder and harder for you to understand what's going on. The crazy thing is, too, the whole baseline of democracy is the complete opposite, is that everyone in government is supposed to work for you and everything the government has is supposed to be open for the public to see and then... The other way around is you're not supposed to know anything about the public. The government's not, not supposed to know anything about the public, but it's the complete opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Literally the complete opposite. They know everything about us and we know nothing about them. I mean, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna like scare anybody, but we live in probably the most, you know, surveillance state than we've ever lived oh, in for here sure. in the States. Yeah. And it's not that it's any different in Europe. You know, it's it's not that it's any different in Asia. It like globally, this is a problem we have. I mean, mm -hmm. in China, they're watching people all the time on CCTV. Yep. That's crazy. Yep. How, ba how bad is like Alexa and Siri in your home? Do you know anything about that? I don't have Alexa or Siri or Google Voice. Do you recommend people against it? I think as long as you understand the risks, 
you know, it's a useful tool. You just have to understand, does, does it fit with your risk profile? Are you putting an, an Alexa in a room where you're probably having discussions that you don't necessarily want to reach the public's ears or to reach some executive at Amazon? Then, yeah. Um, but again, this kind of comes back to the fact of why I wish more systems were open. Because when I speak, there's a black box, piece of software, a piece of hardware, you know, software and hardware running in tandem that receive my command, take an action that I fundamentally cannot see, and then send that off to a web service that is likely probably secured with, you know, HTTPS, you know, so it has a secure connection. And technically that can't be eavesdropped on. But is but that only, something that as a technologist, can I audit that? Right. No, probably not. <laughs> and that's why I think, honestly, you know, when we start seeing things like wider uses of open AI or AI in general or voice assistance, I think there's actually a very interesting connection with some of these like crypto blockchain networks that we've been developing for the last couple of years. Because if you could effectively record the inputs and outputs and maybe even the transformations that these systems take and immutably print that on the blockchain so much that it's very difficult for you to go back and rewrite history, that, that you'd have to have billions of dollars in value to go back and rewrite that history, then I think maybe we're getting closer to a point where we can start to trust these systems because we immutably understand this is the parameters it was fed, this is the outputs that it had. And even if we don't have data, if we can't read the source code or have data on the transformations it's doing, then we can at least look at the inputs and outputs and compare the two. Dude, this has been an incredible conversation and I think we could probably go on for hours. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to ask you my favorite question that I ask at the end of every podcast. And let's keep in mind, I'm asking you not only as a hacker, but as a bilateral amputee, uh, if any advice, what is your advice to everyone out there? You only fail if you do not learn. Ooh. <laughs> if you do the very same thing over and over again and get mad at yourself, that is failure. Oh, okay. Because you didn't learn, you didn't change your tack or your perspective. So there's no failure. There's no failure if you learn. If you get up off the ground and you take a different direction, if you fall six times and you get up that seventh time and you take a different direction, you didn't fail. You learned. All right. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, and thanks for being here during Limb Loss Awareness Month. I'm happy to be able to give you the spotlight this week. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing you at more test runs and just out in the amputee community. You're one of a kind, dude. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And <laughs> that was a the, great pod. For the last couple of years, I've actually been blogging uh, my transformation as well. So if y'all follow me on uh, secretfader.com. Secretfader.com. And your secret fader on Instagram. And where else are you at? Uh, Facebook as well. And uh, not TikTok. Not yet. TikTok. <laughs> <You're> like TikTok. <laughs> I like how he said, and not TikTok. Yet. Uh, and what were your passwords to those? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, bro. Thank you. We'll see you guys next week. Where we share business tips, interview experts, and travel really animated. This week, this on week, two dudes, two dudes, three oh, legs. Yeah, I really like hype it up. This week on Two Dudes, Three Legs. Oh, I like oh, that one. Oh, that was it. Yeah.